Hi everyone, welcome to video number 9 of chapter 3. In this video, we continue our example of solving an LP problem by the simplex method. So we already covered step 1 and 2 and 3, and in particular step 3, the previous video, we showed how to move from one basic solution to another and actually um, make the value z smaller. So today we look at further details. In particular, shall we repeat this process? How do we know it's needed? Or how do we know we can stop? Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so on the board we have the li linear programming system that we had at the end of last video. Now we have x2, x4 as basic variables and uh, z takes the value 15. Okay, these are in highlight. So how, how do we know if we should repeat the process? So recall the discussion we had last time. How did we make the decision to do the process and uh, to move one of the non-basic variables into the basic variable. Well, we remember that we had a conclusion because one of the non-basic variable carry a negative sign. That means if this guy shall turn into positive, and then I can actually make the z smaller. Okay, so here we see that in the objective function, we have still a negative term, negative x1. So that suggests that we need to move x1 into the basic variables. So once we have decided on that, and the next one is to decide um, between x2 and x5, which one I should uh, replace it with, x1. Okay. So in that case, x3 and x4 would remain non-basic, they will be zero. So we can rewrite our constraints out, setting x3 and x4 to be zero. Then the first one becomes x5 is 3 plus 3x1 by moving this to the right-hand side. And then the second one would be x2 here is 6 minus 6x1. And both of these shall be positive because the two variables are always restricted. So we have two inequalities. Okay, um, you can easily work out um, this inequality here. You can move the 3 to the other side. You get negative 3. And then this gives you x1 is bigger than negative 1. And then the second one, you move 6x1 on the other side, and then you get x1 is less than 1. And both of them must hold. It's an AND relation between them. Okay, so let's look at these two constraints. So x1 bigger than negative 1. This always holds, because x1 is a restricted variable, and it's non-negative, so it's always bigger than x, negative 1. And then x1 less than 1, this is a real constraint. Okay? Okay, so we can conclude that x1 now must lie between 0 and 1. Okay? And then we could use x1 as a basic variable to replace x2. And because the largest value x1 can get is 1, and when we have x1 equal 1, we see that x2 becomes 0. So x2 would be moved into the non-basic variable set. Okay, so then um, once you have figured that out, then you just need to carry out another pivoting process, which we have done 
many times. So you would need to pivot the x1 in the second equation because second equation is now the canonical form represented by x2. So you're replacing x2 with x1. So pivot the x1 in the second equation and carry out the process. Okay? So make it coefficient 1 by divided by 6. That's the second equation. And then you can um, divide this by 2, add on top of the first one to get rid of that x1, and that will give you the first equation. You may double check. And then you can take this equation here, which is the new second equation, and add on top of the third one, the objective function, to make that one 0. So that disappears, and you get that. And then, remember, then you also have um, this 1 here will be added on top of negative 15, and then you get negative 14. Okay. So you have a new canonical form of your linear programming problem. Here, let's summarize. What do we have? What's the basic solution? Well, basic solution is x1 is 1, x5 is 6, and all the others are non-basic variables. They are 0 here. Okay? And uh, what's the value of z? Well, it's the negative of this one because the left-hand side is 0. So z is 14. Now we see that by moving from this canonical form with its basic solution to the basic solution of this one, we reduced the z value further by 1. Okay, so we're getting even better. Okay, um, now we are reaching a point where we could uh, check if optimality is reached. So here on the board, I put the canonical form of uh, after the previous step at the basic solution 1 for x1 and then 0, 0, 0 for 2, 3, and 4 and 6 for x5 and z is 14. And let's check what would guarantee that we have reached the optimal point. So the key information for you to check would be the objective function. So let's look at the last equation. What does it mean? The last equation means z equal to all of this plus 14, right? We can move 14 to the other side. And uh, x2, x3, x4, they are all non-basic variables, and they all have positive coefficient. Okay, that's very important. They're all positive. If we are in this situation, what does it mean? So another important key factor to remember is in the basic solution, we have x2, x3, x4 equals 0. That's why z is 14 there. Okay, These are non-basic variables. So would it be beneficial to do one more step of the algorithm? Would we get some even smaller z value? Well, let's discuss. If we shall move any one of these three into a basic variable, then the value of that variable, whichever it might be, would become positive and it will cause the z to increase. You will add a term into it, right? And that's something we don't want because we wish to decrease z. So this indicates that if you have this situation where all the coefficients are positive, then you should not do any more of the pivoting process. And that procedure ends right here. And furthermore, you can also claim that the z value now has in fact reached the minimum value, and the value is 14. 
okay, the negative of this constant here, and the basic solution is x1 is 1, and then 2, 3, 4 are 0 here, and x5 is 6, okay? So this is in red that you can claim now. Okay, then uh, this is the end of this example, and uh, we successfully found the optimal value, that is the minimum value of z, and we also find the optimal point, which is this um, basic solution. Okay, let's summarize. Okay, I would like to give a little summary using a graphic interpretation of the whole process of simplex method. And uh, I will demonstrate this in a two-dimensional setting because high ID it's hard to visualize on the 2D paper. Okay, so what is a simplex method? So simplex method begins with a linear programming problem in canonical form. If it's in canonical form, then we know it has a set of uh, basic variables and the basic solution is feasible. Okay? And then we also know the objective function takes a certain value there. So with that starting point, you seek to move from one basic solution to another with the goal that you would decrease the objective value function until the minimum is reached. Okay, so that's um, complex method in words. And now let's look at the interpretation in a graph. So here is a picture, let me explain. This gray area, that's feasible region, and, uh, and it has boundaries which are straight lines, they are represented by our constraints. So each constraints are a straight line in this region, okay? And that's an important feature of uh, linear programming because we have linear constraints. So at the same time we have a objective function which is linear. That means um, if I draw the contour lines they are all parallel straight lines and there is a direction that the objective function is increasing. So here is draw with an arrow and these black dotted lines are where the z equal constant and z is increasing in that direction. Okay, so important, these are straight lines. And we want to find the minimum. So you start with a simplex method in canonical form which has a basic solution. So let's say this green dot is where you start. It's in canonical form, is the basic solution. Basic solutions are vertexes. It's a, a corner point in 2D of your feasible region. So you start from here, and then you switch one basic variable with another. And what does it effectively do is that you move from one corner to the next neighboring corner. So here you find out that if I move in this direction, I would decrease the objective function. But if I move in that direction, it's not good. So your algorithm will make you move in this direction. And then after one step of that simplex algorithm, you will end up here in another basic solution with a smaller z value. And then, likely, at this point, you will have one turn in the objective function, still with a negative coefficient, and then you move further. And then in the graph, you see that if I move to this corner, I get smaller. But if I move to this neighboring corner, 
I get bigger. So you would choose to move down. And then you perform one more step of these, uh, the algorithm. And you move here. And, uh, and you decrease the z value further. And then here in this drawing, in this graph, at this point, you see that you should still move because you still have a negative term in the objective function. So you make that change and you move down in this direction and you would reach this point, which is red. Once you are there, and then you look at your objective function and you see all the coefficients would be positive then that means if you shall try to move to the neighboring ones, the z value would increase, which is indicated here. So you stop and this becomes your minimum point. Okay, so that's basically the simplex method on a graph if you are in a two-dimensional space. If it's a higher dimensional space, this is a bit harder to visualize, but the core ideas are the same and that's basically what you do moving from vertex to vertex to the neighboring vertex one in the direction where the objective function is decreasing in the hope of finding the minimum okay hope um, that is clear and then explains um, well the ideas and hope you enjoyed it and uh, I'll see you next time